Um, I want to begin this morning by uh, making a very public announcement about our assisting minister, Pastor Will. He works very hard on our behalf, whether you know this or not. Just this week, to give you an idea, I get a text telling me all the places he's been in this last week. For example, May Eisenhart has been in need of our care. Kirsten Merkel, usually is sitting right there, fell. She's had some issues. Jeffrey, her son, had surgery this week. Gloria Christensen is in and out. And we've also been talking to the Glazer family. John is um, getting additional medical care as well. So um, I'm so thankful for his ministry in this way, as I have been public with you. I have to be much more careful um, because uh, Carolyn is getting her next infusion a week from Tuesday. Uh, that makes her immune system very compromised uh, as a result, as am I, you know. So I try to be as careful as I can. Um, but just for that reason, it is great to have Will and a, part, a true partnership in ministry here and, and thankful for all his good work. Uh, secondly, of course, in the, the ways that we continue to do this, I want you to still try to be as safe as you can during these days. It certainly is still uncertain as to what it all means going forward. In that regard, we're still pushing through with hopefully trying to figure out a safe way to do a history event here on October 3rd. And so you'll be hearing more about that. Hopefully we get a Temple Chimes out this week to kind of give a little more information but that goes that way before. This week's busy with us as well. The transition team meets at two, um, and the council meets at seven on Tuesday, uh, a week earlier. Uh, again, that's because I'll be with Carolyn with her transfusion on that next Tuesday all day. And, uh, and finally, choir's starting up again, so if you wanna sing in the choir, let's hear you sing right now. Come on, let's go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> ah, a response. What a wonderful thing. Okay. And so that's about all I've got for this morning, other than Sylvia. Happy birthday. And Jim, too. What? And Jim, too. I can't even hear, you know. Jim. Whatever he says. Jim's birthday. Jim Rhinus. Jim Rhinus. Oh, Jim Rhinus. Oh, I, did, I knew that. I, I mean, I knew Jim. I, I wish him happy birthday, actually. So there you go. Okay. Let us please stand for our confession and forgiveness from Pager Bolton. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Let's begin our worship with our gathering hymn.
communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. you bring forth our salvation, and by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
second reading is from the book of James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder whenever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of bird and beast, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory, to the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. 
You may be seated. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is my supreme hope that those of you who have been listening to me, you have had no choice, for the last uh, period of time, especially when we entered into the assigned gospel for this season, which is the gospel of Mark, that you might remember that uh, this is my favorite gospel, and for uh, one particular reason, First, it's the first gospel that was written that we have. And secondly, uh, Mark develops this very interesting theme. And it's all about our Lord's earthly ministry. It's all about who people think he is. It starts early on, right away, in which uh, he starts doing his earthly ministry after his baptism and and evil goes, we know who you are. Continues through the gospel. In which every time, almost every time he does a healing of someone, he tells them what? Tell no one. But humans being humans, that generally didn't work that way. And now, here we are, the first of three times that Jesus not only comes clean with his disciples, but announces what will take place in his suffering, death, and resurrection. It is still always remarkable to me that here these guys now are following along with Jesus, you know, they're having supper together, they're observing all the stuff that he's doing. And he's not sitting down with them going, and by the way, boys, you know who I am, don't you? All this time. So they're walking around, and you can see that them going like, oh my God, what, what? Especially as his words ring true. Especially as his healing becomes clear. And so here we are, coming up towards the end of his earthly ministry, and he says, who do people say that I am? So, of course, they're talking about it. You hear in the gospel, they throw out a couple things like, John the Baptist, you know, you might know that John the Baptist himself had disciples, and many of them believed he was the Messiah, even after he was killed for his words. Some, of course, thought Elijah because he was a great prophet and well-received and well-honored in the life of the chosen people. Or another prophet could just be one of those prophets that comes along. And the big question, of course, who do you say that I am? With Peter's response, you are the Messiah. And then our Lord's response, in which he tells Peter and the rest of the disciples what this means. We've just been through it. And Peter just can't handle that part of the story. You know that well. As I've said before, you have a mentor in your life. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's someone in your profession. Maybe it's, for me, as I've shared often, it's the Reverend Bill Moldwin, by the way, who I talked to today, or this week, and he greets all of you with a kind heart. He's doing well. But, of course, uh, when we have these people in our life and we find out they're leaving, no! 
No. We understand his rebuking Jesus. Peter's got a lot of guts to him, really, when you think about it. And then comes the kicker. If you're going to be one of my disciples, if you're going to believe that I am the Messiah, then you need to be open to take up your cross, your cross, and follow. Now let us be clear that what he is saying, even in that response, is that what he means by that is, soon these disciples and all the disciples who have followed through thousands and thousands and thousands of years are to be disciples of the sharing of the good news of a loving God who cares about you, who loves you with his spirit, who gives you gifts, plants you in family life, surrounds you with friends. It reminds you that uh, as in anything that you really believe in, you just share that. You're to let people know, and, and we know, as we often talk about during these days, the church is a place where more people need to hear about it. We're back to the first century because of the love of Jesus. And so, yes, the sacrifice that he's talking about is mission work. But it also includes what his ministry was all about, what his cross was all about. And that is, whenever he saw people in need, he tried to do something about it. Whenever he, and he crossed these boundaries that were very strongly put in place by the chosen people, and he didn't seem to respect those. Oh, from time to time he would say his first purpose was to come to the chosen people, and so that's in there, as we've read, read actually recently, but um, to be a disciple of Jesus is to know that every single person you see is loved by God. And every single person you see, if, it, if they have need, you are to fill it. It's what makes God's love for us, it what makes sense. Now I uh, waited for, for this until now because of course, we have been surrounded this weekend uh, by this memory that we, looking out there, I'm sure we all know. It's the old story, and everybody has been asked, you know, where were you on 9-11? Where were you when you saw this terrible attack on our country? Where were you? I myself had only been two weeks into my new ministry at the Lutheran Church of St. Mark in Glastonbury. I was sitting in my office when it all blew up, went home to watch it on a bigger screen. Later in the day, I get a call from uh, one of my members who I was just getting to know and he said, Pastor, I, I've got to come and see you. And we talked about it, so we set up an appointment for early the next morning. He came in, and it just so happened that he had been down there uh, when it happened. He had not been in one of the towers, but he'd been nearby on business, and he, he was one of those who had to walk out, as many did, over the bridges, you know. And he came in to my office wearing the same clothes. All over his clothes was the dust of New York City. 
and he didn't know how to process it. The most powerful story he told me, however, was as he was walking out, as everybody was, ahead of him, he came across an elderly African-American woman who was totally distraught. And he went up to her, and they cried and hugged each other together. You know that a lot of the theme that is always brought up at this time is the, is the reality of the fact that sometimes it appears we only really get it when it is so terribly obvious to us that we need each other. Other times we go on our own way and try to take care of business. It's normal. But when these things happen, it's, we should be so thankful for the people of step it up. First responders, of course, we hear all of those stories. Who, when everybody was coming down the towers, they were going up. Ordinary people who just left everything they were doing and they went down there to see if they could help. In a unified country that had its issues later around who to blame. But at that time, we know, we remember, we are reminded, we're reminded that when this happened, we are to step up. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And as most of us just kind of shelter in our own homes with a mask on, trying to be careful, there are others who go to work, care for those who have been struck down, risk their own family in doing so. It affected, as I've shared with you before, uh, my own life because I have, I still have this uh, Maybe someday you'll get a chance to meet him. This crazy son of mine, he is nuts. <coughs> he doesn't have Facebook, so he never gets to hear me. So I can talk about him. Preacher's kids, of which I am one, you know, always find that difficult, but he doesn't know, so don't tell him. Now, he always wanted to be a Marine since he was in second grade. And uh, when this happened, it was, he was gone. As we know, many uh, answered the call voluntarily. It was different when many of us were younger. There was a draft. Of course, I was in school. A lot of uh, people who didn't go to school were over there in Vietnam. But my son, of course, went. He was in Fallujah. It is the only place where I can go when I hear stories of someone who has lost a son or daughter and try to imagine what that's like. I can imagine what that could have been like. Jesus has asked us to take up our cross and to follow. Jesus has asked us what that means is, first and foremost, to share the good news of a loving God and a wonderful Savior. And the presence of the Holy Spirit that has given you in your baptism that is pushing you out there to share that love with the world but also to know it's also about the basics. Because when people ask, you know, why does God allow these things to happen in this world? 
part of the answer is he's sending us. I pray that as we go forward in ministry in this place and others, that you would know, as is my experience now, an old man leaning in on top of the pulpit, that God has blessed me so abundantly with the call to service people. It's not bad news, it's good news. God has called you in the same way to serve his people. And it's not bad news. It's good news. May we be blessed as we go forward in his love. Amen. confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the whole world, and all in need. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. Continue to nurture your church, that it is a place where your presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creating God, bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You accompany those who are most in need. 
protect any who are, are in danger and sustain them through uncertain and unstable times, especially Sandy, Myrtle, Anna, Walter, Gail, Wendy, Kirsten, Jeffrey, John, Carolyn, Claudia, and Ryan. We also pray for Gloria, May, and John. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Transforming God, break chains of discrimination and injustice. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, our world changed with the 9-11 attacks. We have seen how easily buildings can fall and how quickly lives can end. As we remember 9-11, may it remind us that you are only true security. Give us your strength to face the memory of this attack and the changes it made in our lives. Give us your compassion to help each other and recognize need around the world. Give us your hope as we face an uncertain future. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We give you thanks for the saints who now rest in your remembrance. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who defend our freedom in the armed forces, especially Kevin, Wesley, Zach, Millen, Keenan, Jonathan, Sean, and Chaplain Dominic. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
O oh God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation. And by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, Lord God and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Come, Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us, bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us, awaken your people, fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel. Word of God incarnate, Power the Most High, one God, now and forever. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Come to the banquet, for all now is ready. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep, keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his counsel upon you, give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
with you.